those seeds, fruit, and those seeds fall and they produce more and it produces more and it, now it's multiplying. I can't even count it. And we're not, you know, all the glory goes to him. So he wants fruit that remains and your fruit produces fruit. So when we see people come to Jesus and they're getting saved, the first thing we do, you're going to disciple them. But you were saved to serve. So we take them from light to leadership. And that's a discipleship process, and let's get out there and lead. And we have a mentoring process, too. Mentoring is very different than teaching, and it's different than discipleship. You can disciple 12. Jesus discipled, but mentoring, he also mentors. Mentoring is where you get in the ditch and you do it with somebody. You live in the trenches and you do it alongside as you're raising those up to mentor. And that goes for prayer. Prayer, you're going to see in this little video here, prayer is caught, not taught. It's caught. And so even brand new believers, and I wanted, were you able to pull that up, Pastor? Okay, in just a second. I want to say something um, about cosmos. So I told you that he had a price on my head, and we're going to a little more teaching, and then we're going to have some time to pray. But cosmos, first week he was saved, won seven people to Jesus. And then he, as he was in his two years of discipleship, he is weeping for the rest of the kids in the streets. And he went out and he did research. That's called spiritual mapping. He said, I'm going after the top dogs of the occult and the heroin, uh, the, I mean the drug addicts and the criminals. I'm going after the top dogs. And so then he said, well, you pray for me, all night prayer meeting. He said, I'm going to go out into the streets and win them. Well, first we went and repented in all the places where he caused 100 deaths and 200 deaths and head-on vehicle collisions. Okay, th those, you know, there's a real devil out there working. And so we went and at 4 o'clock in the morning, whole house of prayer, we're on the, on the ground weeping and repenting, and he said, more souls than I ever took. I want to win to the kingdom. And so we're weeping and repenting. So that's the first thing we did. And then the second, he began spiritual mapping, and he said, now I'm going to go after the top dogs, because when you get the strong man, you can spoil the goods. And that's in Matthew. And it also says the kingdom suffers violence. The violent take it by force. And I used to think, I'm going to grab it like this back from the devil. But I saw the force of faith in a room, in prayer, is like a tsunami. It's like a mighty wave. It's like a rushing mighty river, like the Nile River I cross Every time I go north, nothing can stand in the way of that five-level white water. It's force. You're dead if you get in the way of that river. And so that's the way the, the, the power of corporate prayer should look like. So Cosmos said, you pray for me. Stay on your knees. He said, I need to go alone because this is risky, and I'm going to go out at night, and I'm going to get the top, the strong man of the cities. And that's why we do pray for government and go after our leaders because they can influence the others around them. So we stayed on our knees. He goes out. And the first night, you know, at gun, at not gun knife, you know, faced a guy. He knew where they lived, their names. He knew how many gang members they had around them. So we're on our knees praying. There's, there's a good picture in this battle, and I think it's Exodus. Is it Exodus 17? where Moses is on the mountain, Aaron and her, her hold up his hands, and um, Exodus 17, and Joshua's in the battle, in the valley, right, pushing back the Am Amalekites. And so you have the two positions in warfare. You have those holding their hands up, and then Joshua's pushing back. So pulling down, Moses is a picture, pulling down the revival, Joshua pushing back the darkness, both positions. And so we do that a lot. While our guys are out in the field going after them, or I'm out there going after them in person, pushing that darkness back by putting light in the thick of it to dissipate darkness, others are on their, on their knees. So we have a, a prayer and fasting covering while these excursions and battles are going on in the field for the lives of the people. So we're on our knees. He goes out all night, took three nights in a row before this guy dropped his knife and came to his knees and accepted Jesus. And that morning then, he, Cosmos called me and he said, get, re get, get lunch ready. Fifty people are coming to lunch. 
at the house of prayer. And I said, 50? He said, yes, all the criminals and the gang leaders and whatever, these are, he's bringing his whole gang to the house of prayer. And I said, well, that's wonderful. They're on the top wanted list in the police and the FBI and the CID. And they sleep in coffins and they've been murderers and dealers. I mean, ghastly murderers. And they're all 50 of them going to walk into our house of prayer. So first thing I did is I called the police. And I said, we are having visitors today at the house of prayer, and I don't want to see your face. You stay away because you, God is working in their lives, and you're going to give them time to change. Don't you come around, and don't you be looking for them, and don't you even show up. You're going to scare them. Well, they took, they, I had authority to do that because they've seen the transformation in Cosmos' life. And so there's, um, I'll, talk, I'll talk about authority in a minute, but so... So, so they all come in, and then um, we start with praise, and, and then we go into trauma healing, and then discipleship, and, and give them opportunity for the word, and then the last thing is we give them a meal. So this is four hours, all 50 of them, we had a big lunch for them. And then day after day, by the end of the week, all 50 had given their lives to Jesus. Yes, and they brought 50 more the next week, and we baptized 100, and more came while they were being baptized. And this thing has exploded over the last six years, this, the, the revivals in the street. But it was spearheaded by the worst of the worst from the streets, you know, because he carried a burden for, for, for where he had been. And so I said, God, what are we going to do with all these broken, broken people? Well, Micah 4 said he also gets his army from the lame, the faltering, the blind, the crippled, the outcast. That's my army, Micah 4. He's making a great nation out of people that have been spiritually mutilated, emotionally mutilated, physically mutilated, destitute. That's my army. You can read it in Matthew 22, 20, all 22 also when he says, I'm going to prepare a wedding feast. Go and give those invitations. The ones that were so sophisticated and dignified and religious said, oh, we don't need to come. We're too, we're too busy. We have excuses. He said, go out into the streets. I will have a full house. And that's what he says to us. And he says, that he, sa he sent them out two or three times. Keep bringing them in. It's not full yet. And so those are instructions. Those are where he gets his army. And all the people, when I say a thousand missionaries, that's where they've all come from. And so when these people started pouring in, these youth, I said, what am I going to do with these broken youth? And he said to me, you asked me for laborers, didn't you? And I said, this is, this is a bloody mess. I mean, broken bodies and minds and heart. 14 year olds trafficking. And they had been, they live in sex houses from 6 to 26. They're, you know, hired out. A politician can come and hire them at night, pay from the sex house and go sleep with my political opponent and murder them the same night. And so on and on and on, in and out of prison. I mean, just, there's nothing, no family, no growing up. They've been fought, fought with AK-47s for 10 years. Little Susan from 12 to 20, eight years. And then was a sex slave all night for the soldiers. And, you know, I said, make an army? I said, this is going to take 100 years. But he's fast forwarding because he's redeeming the time. And so these kids start coming into our house of prayer every day now, 100 more, 100 more. And he said, I'm going to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, turn the murderers into missionaries and turn the prostitutes into murderers and preachers. He said, if you just let, let, me, let me use you all. And so in our house of prayer, our prayer teams are there. So when they come in, when I talk about prepare for revival, we can't pray for revival unless we're really ready for the next 100 to walk in the door. So I said, it looks like an assembly line. This one might get them. And, you know, just hug on them and, oh, you're welcome here. No matter what they look like, what they smell like, what they talk like, what they think like. That isn't, it's unconditional. Unconditional love. And then it goes to kind of the next group. And they're there for the, we're going to pray for the healing of your heart. And then there's the inner healing team and the woundedness. And then the next team, oh, there's the, got to be deliverance. The flies are all over those wounds, you know. And strongholds broken and generational curses and assignment, all that. Word curses. So the healing of the heart, that's, you know, another thing that I teach on. So then, the, then they go to the next one. They say, now this is, these are the ones that are going to bring restoration, transformation. They've got to learn how to take a bath. I mean, they've lived in the streets. 
they've got to learn how to dress, how to talk, how to, you know. And then the other ones, the discipleship team, they're pouring the word in. Now we're going to go into the streets and evangelize every day, but we're going to get discipleship every, discipled every day too. And so they do that. Every day disciple and then go share your faith. And the next day disciple and then share your faith so that it's always application. And within about two months, these kids are the most violent, radical worshipers and prayer warriors you've ever seen. When we've had visitors come over, these kids have been saved a couple years. I said, no, about two months. And they can't believe it. So just a little clip. Um, I, asked, I asked Cosmos one time, by the way. I said, talk to me about why Coney said he was disarmed, Joseph Coney, the dictator, when we prayed. And he said, because you prayed in, you prayed in faith. And I said, well, how do you know the difference? How does the devil know the difference? If two people are praying and one in faith and one is not, Jesus, should, you know, there's a story in the word about two people praying. One is in pride and one is in humility, the, the Republican and the sinner. But faith and no faith, how does the devil know? And he says, oh, we know. He said, there can be a whole bunch of people together for a prayer meeting making a whole lot of noise, and it never gets through the roof. I said, really? Because they see in the spirit realm. They live in the spirit realm. See, we live so much in the natural, but God would show us these things if we'd ask. He'd just, you know, call on them, and I'll show you things you don't know. And so he said, we know that the, they're prayed in faith with about three things. When you pray the word, Okay, because faith comes by hearing. You're speaking in faith, okay? And then another one is he said, when they pray, willing to obey everything they just prayed for. Healing of the land, the sacrifice, the loss, go get them. Get in other words, pray, then go do. Pray, and then go do. And take action. He said, because prayer without the backing of your life is meaningless because you don't mean what you're praying for. You know, just save the nation, save the nations, and God says, well, can you go next door? You know, that kind of thing. So if there's no obedience, remember, Jesus backed his intercession with his life. Here I am, send me, Isaiah said. So the willingness to be a part of your answer. Does that make sense? So that's what Isaiah did, Jesus did, all of them. I'm willing but then he decides whether, you know, what you do and how you do it. So the enemy knows whether, the, whether he, you know, he sees actions or, or not. So, um, but this, these girls on this little video, I'll just show you just little clip it so we'll move fast. Two, two different kinds of videos. One of them, when these young boys come in off the street, you know that there's um, father wounds and there's fatherless wounds in so much of our youth, fatherless generation. And then there's wounds from the fathers. And so there's a distortion of identity. And after the war stopped, God said, I'm going to heal the destiny of the people. So when God brings revival and broken people come through our doors, expect God to begin healing the mind, the body, the heart, the soul, the emotions, the family, the marriages, the finances, and the destiny. Paul said, I want your eyes to be open so you can see the hope of your calling in Ephesians 1. And lots of people are aimless and wandering because we don't know our destiny. What am I here for? What's my real direction? What's my dream? What's my vision? What did you create me for, God? And that's the greatest fulfilling and fulfillment in life when we know our destiny and our purpose and our direction, at least for seasons, you know, even if it changes, but at least for seasons. So these kids know right away. But... In a couple of months. So when they first come in, we were having a three-week prayer meeting. And this is just little snippets from that prayer time. Three solid weeks of prayer and fasting. And it's when Afghanistan was, um, all that stuff was happening rather recently. Okay? So we went into prayer and fasting for Afghanistan and for terrorism in the nation and the others on the street. So we always have a topic. Well, all of our youth, by this time we have like fresh 200 still being sanctified, you know. I said, we're, we're born again, but salvation is a process. 
you know. So they're still being sanctified, but they're radical in worship and prayer life. I mean, they're just, they're getting discipled. And they're new believers. They don't even, they've never heard the word Afghanistan. They don't know what that is. But we're in a prayer meeting as adults, as staff, all staff in from the field, hit the floor. We're going to fast and pray three weeks. And these new born again young people, well, we want to do it too. I said, we're going to go all day, no food. We're going to stay under that tent. No, we want to pray. We want to pray. We want to pray. And for three weeks, for eight hours a day, under that tent, and God did so many miraculous things, and he does every time we do this. But this was just a very a unique time because it was right after such a great revival of these young people coming in, and immediately those young girls went into travail. And I'd watch 14, 15-year-old girls travailing, weeping, crying out on their faces. And I looked at the staff, and I said, just like the, I said about the, As the Methodists, I said, you look at this as a birthing room. I said, God is doing something supernatural. And two to three weeks later, we had another hundred come to the Lord. So they're birthing the, the next generation, the ones they just came out from. And we can do that for multi multiple at a time, you know, cities and locations. Isn't it interesting that Rebecca had nations in her womb? And I always say, I have nations in my womb. I have cities in my heart because he said, ask me for a nation and I'll give them to you. Sons ask for supply. Servants ask for supplies, but sons ask for cities. That's the difference between this and this. Servants, give me, give me, give me, do, 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 do. Sons say, Daddy, can you trust me with another city? Because he told us to ask him. So, so these girls, the same thing, they're just, they're birthing. And Rebecca had these nations in her womb, say cities in my heart, and then people, names in my mouth. And so what's happened, two things here, when you see these girls, these, the men, I told our staff, our team, our missionary team, I said, all of you get one of these young boys that's in our, in our gift program. We call it a gift transformational. It's not a rescue, it's transformational. A thousand girls being trafficked and everything, said, turn them into missionaries. God's Institute for Transformation, that's what gift stands for. So they're a gift. I don't care if they're a bloody mess, they're a gift to the kingdom. And we love them like we gave birth to them. And so they know that. So God's Institute for Transformation. I said to all of our missionary team, I said, you grab one of these boys. And I said, I want, you to, I want to see you one to one. And I said, I want you to be the spiritual father in the natural that these boys never had. And I want you to embrace them. And I want you to love them. And I want you to pray, hold their hands. You can see them walking two by two by two. And you just intercede. That's how they learn to pray. And these guys catch it. It's amazing. And, in, and, and God heals heart wounds in a few minutes without years of counseling in his presence. And we watch that happen. And, and uh, so anyway, if you just play just the few, few seconds of the, this, is it okay? So this is under the tent for those three weeks we were there. In the background, you can see them walking and praying two by two, a father and a son, a father and a son, and all these guys, father and a son, father and a son. We can't bring sons to glory without spiritual fathers. And Hebrews 2.10 says, I'm going to bring sons to glory, and we have to have spiritual fathers to do. See, that I'm sitting on the ground with that little boy, just... <coughs> So this is what our prayer meetings look like. I think we had about 250 under the tent. You want to go to the next one where they're on their knees? And you can see that, yeah.
Even our little six-year-old kids came. You know, the babies came. The moms bring the child. They lay on the mats. We're out there eight or ten hours each day for three weeks. And these young little girls that came off the streets, some of the, the young ones are the ones just off the streets in prostitution and trafficking, weeping in the next wave of the harvest. Just weeping them in. Six, little six-year-old children prophesying. Some are warring. Some are weeping. Some are worshiping. Some are reading the word. I mean, it's just the, the presence of God is so, so powerful that we just could go like this for hours. And then somebody will lead in prophetic intercession. Sometimes it's two by two. Sometimes it's we're agreeing with somebody, you know, reading. The, he's on his knees worshiping. <clears throat> Men are weeping, men giving birth. It's just, these are our school teachers, our drivers, our field missionaries, our IT, our accountant. I mean, it's the whole army out there. Actually, actually, it's not all of our staff because we have about 250 field uh, home missionaries and then all the field staff. So those are just clippets, but people don't want to stop. You do that for three weeks, they go, do we have to quit? I said, well, we can't live in the, you know, tent of the tent of tabernacle on the mount of transfiguration <laughs> we got to get down where the work is so by the way do you have that sheet hun okay we uh, good anybody else didn't sign up that what okay could you pass it and we can just keep passing it around when you're done wave the sheet and somebody get it put it on the back and then put a star if you didn't get your book okay and we'll make sure you got some books so um City strategy, and let me just say this um, a little bit here. <clears throat> As a city, we are praying for cities, and, and I appreciate so much what David said. If you want revival here, one, one good way is to sow into revival, <laughs> you know, because what you, what you get, you receive. And so cast your bread on many waters, it comes back to you. When we're getting city strategy, when we're getting spiritual mapping, um, I learned some things from Suzette Hatting, who was Reinhard Bonnke. Have you all heard of Reinhard Bonnke? Reinhard Bonnke's lead intercessor. And she taught, spirit, taught spiritual warfare. And when Reinhard Bonnke goes to these crusades back then in Africa, he wouldn't even lay hands. He'd just start pacing and praying, and dead bodies would start moving, you know. And so, and we've seen the dead raised, and, and governors get saved. Because why are Muslims coming to Jesus and governors? Because they want to serve the God that has the most power, they want to serve the God that's alive, and they want to serve a God that loves them. And those are three reasons we're seeing radical salvations amongst witch doctors, occult, Islam, you name it. And so when we go to these, cru when we do a crusade for seven days, we pray and fast for three weeks. So the strong man is bound. All the miracles in the Bible happen. And just thousands upon thousands upon thousands come to Jesus, and then we follow it with discipleship. So usually uh, we see dead children raised because the, the, ch the babies are dedicated to Satan at birth in the land, especially during the war, not so much as much anymore. And so beads are tied around their waist, and there's cuts in the scalp where they sew things under the scalp, like teeth and hair and umbilical cords in, in, the, in their dedication to the demonic. And so when these kids get saved, they're radically, radically pulled out of, out of darkness. And it's the same with, with ours here, too. So God can heal the memory and the destiny quite quickly. But we get a map out. We love maps. So if you walk into our center, missionary training center, we call it, and it's a missionary movement, hundreds upon hundreds. Like I said, we have 1,000 missionaries, and they've signed up to die for their faith, literally. And so along the walls, we took the country of Congo, and it's a six-foot map. We printed it and framed it. And then we got, you know, Kenya and Somalia and Eritrea and Chad and Ethiopia and Central Africa Republic and Rwanda and, you know, and then, and then Morocco and Egypt, so all of these countries. And as we are praying, we'll say, you know, if you have a burden, if you come from that language group, you stand beside the map, and we're going to do battle for that territory. And then when we're, at, so there's many things we do in prayer and then fast for these nations and fast for the strong men of these nations. But when it's time to go is when you really need strategy. So in prayer, you need instructions. 
But really, when you go and mobilize, you need, you need strategy from the Lord. And so we get the map out, and we say, where are all the unreached people groups? Where are the blood and guts and the tribal wars? Where has U.S. and US, UNM, UN said off limits? Then we know that that's serious. Okay, that's where we're going. Because that's where the church is targeted to go. Jesus never sent us out to comfortable areas. In the New Testament church, where are they targeting? They're targeting every single place that's dark. Every single place that doesn't have the gospel, they're going to take it. Paul said in Romans 15, I'm not going to take Jesus where he's already preached. I'm going to take him where he's never been, been preached before. Because we have an unfinished task. Now, in America, we have a lot of unreached people. I agree. And refugees coming in, and they need to be reached. But I will say it's available here. At churches and, you know, radio stations and books. and but, you know, It's available. And te television and so forth. Over there, it's not. So we have to approach it different. And here it's available. So when you pray into that and you, and you look at darkness. When I was in uh, Oklahoma and I began spiritual mapping, because that's where I, I, I heard um, Suzette Heading. And she talked about the demonic py pyramid of hierarchy. And you can see that in Ephesians 6. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, strongholds, darkness, wickedness, and heavenly places. Well, just like our military has ranks of authority, so does the satanic realm, you know. And so he's got a bunch of little devils around here, then he's got captains, then he's got majors, and then he's got the general of the army, you know, the top dog. And, and that's what Daniel was coming up against in Daniel chapter 9 and 10. As he repented and prayed for the land, God really released Gabriel, and then Michael came to his aid to help him because the strong man and the prince of the power of the heir of Persia was so strong, it took him three weeks. You know that in Daniel 9 and 10, right? And so God said, we heard you from the first day, Daniel. It says that in Daniel. You study those two chapters. They're very, very critical for where we are now. We heard you from the first day. But it took us three weeks to get this man tied up so Israel could be free. How many weeks is it going to take for the strong man over our cities and our states to be bound so we can be free? Well, how many years has he been loose? You know, so this isn't just a little pick in a weed battle. This is pulling up a stump that's gone pretty deep in the roots. And so... He said, thank God you didn't stop. Now, when we get a map out, let me finish that topic before I step into, into a story about this. When we get a map out and we look at those strongholds, which areas need the most light and which areas will see the most light? The darkest. Right? And we cannot fight darkness with binding and loosing. You're going to fight darkness with, with, with obedience. I mean, you can bind and loose all you want to, but the best way to fight darkness is just put light right in the middle of it. Right? That means go. That means go. Because you are the light. And the light dwells within you. We are the light of the, he is the light of the world. He dwells in us. So we, we, be, so we go. So we say, if God's going to invade that darkness, we've just prayed, now let's go to put light in the middle of it. We're going to go step in the darkest, the most dangerous, the most desolate, the most off-limit places. And that's what we did in Oklahoma. So I said, where are the heroin addicts? I was in Memphis, and he took me seriously. He came out of the office, and he had big maps over the city. I want to see your maps over regions and over this and over that. And you have located on there. Where's the most trafficking? Where are the prostitutes? Where are the dealers? Where are the most crime? Where's the most accidents? You study your region. And when you do spiritual mapping, you study darkness and you study light. Who's in there doing something? Well, good. Get in there and do it with them. We don't need to walk on each other. We need to join each other. So we find somebody already doing it. Well, let's come on. We're going to come beside you. And he said, oh, there's a big church right across the street that's a LB. I don't know all those letters, and I don't need to learn them. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? Okay, all the letters. So that's their church, and that's who leads it, and it's public. And I said, oh, good. When did you have a prayer meeting on the front sidewalk in front of their church? Well, we haven't done that. And I said, and I saw some pretty rainbows painted on the intersection. I just thought they were very colorful. I didn't have to do with those rainbows, man, <laughs> until they told me. And I said, so have you had a prayer meeting out there on them? 
well, no. And I said, if we just stay in our little four walls and have our prayer meeting, how are you going to kick the devil in the butt and bind him up? And so, you know, we got to say, where is the worst darkness? So we went into the lay on the cement in front of the abortion. Whatever you have to do, God will give instructions and strategies. Now, Darkness, light dissipates darkness without you even fighting it. Dave, Daniel didn't get up and do a real sweat. He boohooed a lot of tears. And God bound the strong one. So that was another way to battle. And then there was, remember, because it's the mo, like the Moses and the, and the Joshua in the battle. All right? Joshua's going to take the territory. Moses is maybe boohooing a lot of tears because his arms are aching. But there was spiritual significance in, in pulling down the light of heaven. So both are needed. Push back the darkness, pull down the light. So when we spiritual map, we do several things. We locate the places of the strongholds, and then we identify them, and we write them down. And then we say, what now, what is your strategy? Do you want us to go in two by two? Do you want me to send in 12 men? Cosmos was the one that said, I'm going out at night by myself. And I listened to him, even though he's a brand new believer, because he knows what he's talking about. He said, but I want a whole army on their knees behind me all night till I come back. Okay, okay. So we do it different. So you, then you ask God, how are we going to attack that? What if you found one worst of the worst kind of sinners in one of these neighborhoods, and you get them saved, and then you put the prayer meeting in their house? And that's what we do. Get the witch doctor saved, and then I want the prayer meeting in his house. You know why? Because all the other witch doctors are going to come see what's going on. And he's going to be a, the greatest testimony. And so this is, this is what's happening. So in spiritual mapping, you're getting instructions, and you're getting, and you're getting strategies. Now, one time, I want to tell you two, two different little stories that are along with this. One time, we were in our staff. About this many people were praying and fasting. No, actually, it's probably double this at that time. This was back some years ago. And I said, God, I want another breakthrough. I want another breakthrough. I want another. That's more land, more territory, more cities. We're already in South Sudan going and whatnot. And I heard the Lord say, then get Komagum saved. I said, Komagum. Okay, so he is, everybody's tried getting that man saved. And he is the naked legion demon possessed of the town like Jesus found in the in the graveyard and he's been a historical monument in the town for 20 years people have tried catching him he kills they fear him he's as slippery as a snake he's stark naked he can get through your arms they finally got a whole military troop cr uh, uh, troop captured him chained him and drove him eight hours away to an insane asylum in, in the city. Locked him up. He escaped all the chains, doors, and locks. <coughs> Duh. The strength of the enemy. And then he runs by foot an eight-hour drive. And he's right back. And he stands stark naked in the little intersections of this town. This is actually not too long after the war stopped. So he's opium abuser brain damage because the rebels have cracked his skull with something, prostitution, high, high, high level of the demonic, you name it. And when I heard the Lord say that, I mean, so we were seeing revival and everything just kind of bypassing that man, well, one day he'll get saved, but, you know, who's going to catch him? I mean, it was like, and I heard the Lord say, because I, I, I read this in a Yang Yi Cho book when he went into Seoul, Korea. And he went in to have revival meetings night after night, and nobody came. And he goes, what's going on? One little lady came, sat on the front row every night. And he says, this is, all I'm gonna, this is the only harvest? What? I'm not going to preach to one lady night after night. How, com how come you're, you gave me seven days to do this? And she's the only one sitting here. That night. And the Lord said, well, how much have you ministered to her? And it was like he was indignant and insulted with the Lord, like you, you just gave me this one little widow lady. He said, well, you haven't been faithful with her. So he starts ministering to her, gets her saved, realizes all the strongholds of the city are wrapped up in that one little lady. And as soon as he got her saved and set free, the next night, the place is packed with standing room only. God did that because it was a supernatural move because the strong man was bound. 
Now we can pray in the harvest. We can't pray in the harvest if the strong man's not found. So when he said, get Komagum saved, I'm having flashbacks to that story of Yonge Cho. And I said, okay. I told the team right here. I said, okay. God wants to bring in a whole nother wave of revival, but we need to get Komagum saved and free. And then I just went on teaching whatever we were doing and the rest of the devotions. Kind of forgot about it because we go through two hours of prayer and devotions every day, you know, and most of it intercession. And so that night, about 2 o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call from the team. We got him. We got him. I'm sound asleep. I mean, I'm just, I said, you got who? We got Koma Goom. I said, what do you mean you got him? Because we all know. I mean, he's just, he's slippery. His whole body, he, he sleeps on, on, on piles of, of, of trash, rubbish. And he eats them. He's got dreadlocks. He's covered with feces. He's got it under his face. I mean, it, it's just a sight, physically and, and very strong. And everybody's afraid of him. So I said, oh, really? And then they said, and he'll be at prayer meeting tomorrow morning. I said, oh, good, bring him. And I went back to sleep. So I kind of forgot. I get, I get, I, here's prayer meeting in the morning. Because, I, I mean, it's a naked man, so I, I would hope the men went after him and not the ladies. So they had to grab him. So he's at prayer meeting the next morning. And, 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 and our guy said, we went after him, and we had enough strength to grip him while the others prayed and cast the devil out of him. And he said, then we gave him a bath. We cut his hair. He's dressed, and, and he's in our prayer meeting. Now, this man is in his probably 30s, and he's been like this since he was a teenager, so 15, probably even 20 years. And there he is in his right mind, sitting fully clothed, and his hair is cut. And unless you knew what his face looked like, you wouldn't even recognize him. And he's at our 8 o'clock prayer meeting the next morning. Now, in a few minutes, the whole city got word of this. I don't know how. It went around like wildfire. During devotions and intercession, we had knocks on the gate, and the government officials were coming because they all knew Komagum, and nobody could ever touch this man. And they're walking in. We go, we heard you got Komagum. We, we, we heard you got him. We heard you. I said, yeah, well, we didn't get him. God did. But I said, he's sitting right here. So they all came in, and they're looking at him like, is that, could that be? And, and he reaches out, shakes his hand, good morning, sir. You know, and like they're just astounded. And many of those officials have, have come to Jesus. So anyway, they, they go out and leave. Well, two, a few hours later, then it's time for our noon hour prayer meeting. So this is just morning devotions for two hours. And then at 10 to 12, the noon hour, that's when the community piles into the house of prayer. And so I go over there that day. I don't always go because we're in the field a lot. But that day, and I get there to the house of prayer. And there's a, there's a long line waiting to get in. And this place can seat like 400. I realized it was only, there was standing room only inside. The place is packed. And outside waiting to get in are a long line of pastors that I knew from the villages all the way around. All of them holding tightly to a naked person. I wished I'd had a video, but no, I don't. So, <laughs> so there's a long line of them. And I look at them. I go, Pastor, what are you doing? We can't get the devil out of them. And I said, you're supposed to know how to do this. So afterwards, we taught the pastors how. But they said, we brought them. We heard about Komagum. I said, oh, come on in, come on. And one after the other, as God would free you, and they get clothes on, they were in our Bible school the next day. Talk about a wave of revival. I mean, just a wave. The place is just thousands upon thousands more come to Jesus. And the church realizes we've got the power to do this. We're, as soon as we, now we're praying this high all the time. We never diminish in our prayers just because God came in and did it. No, we've got, another, we got a, another territory to claim. We're not quitting here. Somebody said if you stop praying and fasting for God to just give you, you know, a, a little bit of electricity or fuel for the generator, would you quit fasting? I said, are you kidding? We've got territories to take. And so, so then the next one was, we're still praying up here. But after months and months and months of that revival, I said, God, what's the next wave you want to do? What's the next wave? And he said, I want to show myself mighty from the hospital. So I actually went down to the hospital, and he loves to show off in signs and wonders. We don't, we don't pursue those. They follow us, right? Signs and wonders follow you. 
We pursue the miracle worker. We pursue Jesus and what he does, he does. But I said, I'm always asking, bring me the outcast and the broken. So I said, okay, we're the most broken people. These guys dying in the hospital with diseases and they're dropping like flies and there's no treatment from HIV and cholera and, and leprosy and all that. So I went down to the hospital with our whole team. I said, you go down there. And I said, you ask us for everybody that's terminally ill and ask them if we can have them. And, it, and, and I said, we'll, we'll carry them on a cot. And if they're, they're going to die anyway, if the family will give permission, we'll just lay them up here in the house of prayer. All of the terminally ill. I said, because God can make an army out of them. That's who we're after. That's who we're after. The prostitutes speaking, sleeping in the coffins, the gang dealers. I told the, 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 the most killingest, they called it, the most killingest tribe in South Sudan. I said, I've been looking for you for a long time, and so is Jesus, because you're going to make the best missionaries on earth. Because you're afraid of nothing. God needs you on his side. And so we just look for them, but we don't see them as they are then. So when we went to the hospital and they said, sure, you can have them. And we probably had 20 or 30 just laying on cots and a family member come with them. And they didn't expect anything to happen. They're going to die anyway. Might as well die in the, in the house of God, you know. So we just start worshiping, have our prayer meeting. And one by one by one, it was just like popcorn miracles, you know, over the next 24 hours. The presence of the Lord just settled. And our guys stayed up all night and worshipped and everything. And they were just totally healed and restored. Many of them became our staff after that. So this is where God gets his army. Now, one more word about the battle. I want to give time for question and answers. But um, I, I want about the battle. The battle for your words. I believe it's Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, where God said, I came on behalf of your words. Now, we had just bought property up in South Sudan for our radio station. And I was up there, uh, uh, you know, putting in the house of prayer and the radio station and all that. And, um, and then I came back down to Gulu. Now, I'm talking in Gulu about enlarge your borders. If God's given you your neighborhood, take your city. If he's given you your city, take your state. If he's given, you know, always expand. He's always after enlargement. So I was praying this. I was teaching this in Gulu. Stretch out your cords, lengthen your stakes, Isaiah 54. As soon as I finished teaching this, I got a call from Sudan saying, we've just been thrown off our property where our house of prayer, our radio station is. And the judge has given orders to evict immediately. The gates closed, everything. We're locked out, couldn't even take a piece of paper, thrown out under the road. It's over. That's it. And I said, Lord, I just finished teaching on borders and expanding your territory. And within five minutes, I get a phone call. I said, what just happened? He said, the devil came for your words. Never forget that. Your words, prophetically in prayer, activate war in the heavenlies. I know you know that, but Revelation 12 talks about there's a war in the heavenlies. Okay, talk to me more. And he said, well, the seed and the sower, Matthew 13, remember? The seed... It can be money, his word, our words. When we speak the seed, some of it fell by the wayside and the birds ate it. The word of God didn't take root. The birds ate it. So the enemy's coming to steal that seed constantly from our hearts and the hearts of others. So he said, you just finished teaching on it, and the devil's coming to steal the seed. He's going to see what you're made of. Well, what to do battle with the prophecies, 1 Timothy 1.18. So I said, now talk to me. How are we going to win this one? And he says, well, I come for your words too. And that's when he took me to Daniel 10, 12. He said, the devil come for your words, but I came for your words too, just like I did Daniel. But it may take me three weeks, but I heard you from the first day. That's your words. So every time we're speaking the prophetic and the will of God, we have just activated war at another level in the heavenlies. And isn't that fun? So I said, in the in immediately, okay, 40 days of prayer and fasting. Now, I'm in Uganda, U I'm in Uganda saying, we're going to go 40 days in prayer and fasting for God's property he's just given us in South Sudan. It wasn't even in their own nation. So 40 days we finished praying. On day 42, we get a call, and the government calls us and said, you can have, you can have your property back. God bound the strong man through fasting, it's atomic bomb, and he said, the judge was bribed, this won't happen again, take access, praise God, battle's over, no it's not, 
So I get up there to South Sudan, and I just thought, well, we just finished that battle. God just conquered in our words and 40 days of fasting and atomic bomb, and isn't this glorious? I mean, very humbly, but we're learning all this. Now I'm in South Sudan, all right? We're occupying. We're right back on that property. We paid for it. We have the title, and we had to fight another 40 days fasting just to, just to keep it. And so... I'm up there, and all of a sudden, I heard big soldiers. I said about seven-foot soldiers. They've all got AK-47s, a law unto themselves, screaming, banging, clanging, chains, you know. And, uh, and I've been in ambushes and stuff before, so you know what it looked like. And they just didn't shoot anything, and there's not really a conscience in doing any of that. So I get a text message from our little accountant and the House of Prayer guys, and they said, we're being evicted again. We're being evicted, government orders, the soldiers are holding us at gunpoint, emptying every office, taking the keys and screaming. Well, I could hear the screaming right outside my little door. So I have a little door there, it's in the cu cement cubicle where I sleep and where I work. And I text back to our team, I said, you obey their orders, do exactly as they say, but don't tell them I'm here. And I got up and I locked my door real quietly, and I could hear them moving around from door to door, shrieking threats and kicking and banging and I could hear all of our staff being evicted and I could hear keys they got to my door furious that they couldn't open it and they kicked and they banged and they could kick that door in a big old boots I'm talking seven foot soldiers and all of them are armed with the with the AK-47 probably and a pistol because I've they've they've jumped in my car like that before <laughs> so anyway um I stand there very peacefully in the center of the room. I said, Lord, we just won this battle. And I said, this is your property. And do you know how much harder it is to regain something you lose? <coughs> Look at our nation. How much harder is it to regain? Wouldn't it have been better if we had back when said no? Roe versus Wade, are you kidding? You can take me out before I let them in. You know, and, and at that point, be willing to die for our faith. But we weren't. And so we lost ground. And I thought, I ain't losing this ground. You can use my blood, Lord, if you want to, but I'm not leaving. And they screamed and kicked and threatened. And then right there in the, just this peace of God, I was thinking of Ephesians 6 and having done all to sta stand, but I knew I was standing, and I knew I was standing right in the enemy's territory, but... God's promises. And after a few minutes, they walk out. Big old gate closes. It's about 10 feet, you know, chains. So I'm a prisoner inside. Couldn't get out if I wanted to. And all the rest of our staff is outside. And I waited till it got, got quiet, and I went and I peeked outside, you know, and they were all on the ground on their knees, you know, praying. And, uh, and, our, and our, they called a lawyer who went to the courthouse. Six hours later, not six weeks later, Six hours later, they came back and said, the judge was bribed, and he's being removed from his office, and we've been given court orders that this will never happen again from government's office. We are totally protected. Now, we fought the same battle, but it wasn't six weeks now. It was, it was, it was six hours. And I see that when we stand in this battle, having done all to stand, and we take the ground and we say we're not backing up, the battles are going to become faster and faster. We're going to see an acceleration of victory. We're going to see accumulation of the prayers that have gone before us culminating into victory. So remember, if, 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 if we have doubts at all about battle and war, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. 2 Corinthians 10. They're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. That's weapons. Why would he talk about weapons if we didn't need them? Why would he talk about weapons if we weren't in a war? And then he said, I've made you more than conquerors. And then he said, you're seated with me in heavenly places. Through our God we shall do valiantly. It is he who treads down our enemies. Why would we have all these verses if we didn't need to go to battle? Exodus 15, Exodus, a man of war. I love to say he's a sweet, you know, romantic bridegroom. He's the guardian and bishop of our soul, our healer, our redeemer. Yes, 
and a father to the fatherless and a husband to the, or, to the widow. But he is also a man of war. And if we're going to be his helpmeet, we got to get up, right, and go to battle. Or we'll never be able to fight along his side and keep pace with him. So piece by piece, he has taught us these things. Now, this is your... St- I will say that after 20 years of being in Africa, I always say, no, I've come across America, I jump in my car, and I run across the country and talk about prayer and revival and everything God's doing, then I go right back. And people have offered us a piece of property for an office before, and I've always said no. This time after somebody came three times to me, I said, okay. So we actually have a small office in Brandon, south of Tampa. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. And so that was a gift, and it's a house of prayer, and prayer goes out on the lines constantly from there, as well as now we go teach. I'm raising a team to go teach and help in citywide prayer things, and then looking at how we can bring trauma healing into our schools. Trauma healing, based on forgiveness, is such a radical transformation that fast that we're being asked to take it into the parliament by the South Sudan government. And so we have generals, a hundred generals at a time, fully clad, on their knees, weeping, because we talk to them about being about forgiving others in order to be healed, right? But you cannot give what you haven't received. You can't forgive forgiveness if you've never received forgiveness. It doesn't mean anything to you. You can't give something you don't owe. So let's introduce you to the great forgiver. Oh, they come. I want the great forgiver, Jesus. Then they give forgiveness. And we've watched guns dropped on an attacking tribe when we're in the middle of teaching this in the bush and the jungles because we're in about 400 locations teaching. And because of instant forgiveness, that tribe did not retaliate. And the ones killing and fighting dropped their guns and walked away. The government is now standing at attention. So I asked the Lord, I said, in America, when elections were here, 216 and then 220, I came back and, ta- and there was a lot teaching on spiritual warfare and prayer for request. But I said, let's see all the changes we need at the government level. Does that mean we're doomed? He said, oh, no, my army is not at the government level. My army is at the grassroots level. Because it's like a pyramid, Right. It's got a few people at the top and this, but the army of God grassroots, the nameless, faceless underground movement is going to be with the you and I's that nobody's heard of and nobody knows. But all of a sudden, there's a movement like termites coming underground to eat away at the fabric system of evil and it crumbles and nobody even knows how it fell. And then you go on to the next building and guess what? God gets all the glory. But when a big elephant comes in, and stomps and knocks something down, you know, he's out of there. And, and the elephant gets the glory. But when it's termites, nobody even sees him or knows. And so this is what the army is, should look like. And guess what? If it's the root system of evil that has infiltrated America, and we bring godliness there, it will go up the trunk and affect the fruit. Because that's where the sap comes from. It comes from the soil. So it's a tremendous movement. Now, just something real quick on covenant. I can't give a strategy for your city. I will say that in all the traveling I've done in the states, probably 30 or 40, I don't know, more than states on prayer, I've not seen a state as interlocked in prayer systems and prayer movements as Florida. So compared to, I'm not comparing you to the New Testament church, (laughs) but I'm comparing you to the rest of America. And so, so you've made great strides, and, and that's awesome. Now, what can God do to take you another level? Sense of authority. I cannot give you a strategy for your city, but I'm going to tell you one strategy, then I'm going to close with that, have question and answers, because I could tell stories all day. But th- there's four kinds of authority, and I asked the Lord this one time. Talk to me. So he just downloaded. Maybe you can find it in a book or somewhere, but I don't know, or something better than this, but this is what I go by, is what he's taught me. There's inherited authority, and we inherit that as children of the king. 
right? So, so sons and daughters, we go as ambassadors of heaven when we're in the Lord and growing in the Lord. That's inherited. There's delegated authority. And a pastor that's going to leave town will probably say, I'm going to be gone for two weeks, so I'm going to give the oversight to the associate pastor, right? So he delegates. So that's there, okay? Then there's um, earned authority. And earned authority is because you've been faithful and you're elevated in your rank now, just like in the army, in the military, or with the servant who was faithful with the talents. And God said, now I'm going to make you rule over 10 cities because you've multiplied what I gave you. And then there's the covenantal authority. And the covenantal authority is like Abraham. God made Abraham a promise. As far as your eyes can see, I'm going to give you this land. And then to Joshua, where the soles of your feet tread, that's your land. And that means that you have ownership of that land. You were born there. I do not have the same covenantal authority as a Sudanese believer. And when the Africans come here, they do not have the same covenantal authority as you do. And I realized, too, I didn't have much covenantal authority in America even. I am dual citizen, but I have no property here. I had no income, so I didn't, you know, there's no tax, nothing. I'm just living on ministry property over there. And so I thought, God, what covenant? Now I'm born here, so it's my birthplace. But you have covenantal authority in Florida. You own property. You pay taxes. This is your dwelling place. This is your land. And you have more authority over Florida than a visitor coming in from Kansas or California to come pray with you. They can't pray with the same authority. You are a gatekeeper, Psalm 24. That's a covenantal authority with this land. God is trusting this state to you, and you will give an account to it. You will give an account for this state and this state. I'm going to give an account someday for what did I do when I'm back here with the nation of my birthplace, as well as what have I done with the nations he trusted me with there. And we're in about eight going to ten this year. It's nations, not just cities. And so that's covenantal. Now, covenantal authority comes with a lot of responsibility. You cannot run away from it. If you're a believer, you are a gatekeeper. And God is raising up, you know, the verses, Isaiah 62, watchmen on the wall, never lose their peace, and then Psalm 24, Go through the gates and swing them wide. The king of glory. Who is he? He's a mighty man of war. He wants to come into your city. Well, we just want peace, Lord. Well, you, you don't have peace anyway. You know, go ask the guys on the streets and the babies about to be killed in the womb if there's any peace. No. So swing wide the gates and let the mighty man of war come in. The mighty man of war will bring peace. And even though it may not be political peace, we walk in absolute peace and rest. I like what Suzette Heading said, too, and I think you were praying the resting and the warring earlier, Teresa. She said, hit and hide, hit and hide. Psalm 91, do your battle from the secret place and then go back under the wings and rest. Do your battle from the secret. Go. So when we pray citywide prayer, and I'll just give you these instructions. I will be writing them out, and I will talk on a video that has nothing on that except for just these are the strategies. And this is how we did it. You can use, it, use them or change them or whatever God's telling you. But when we did the first national prayer gathering, first of all, I wanted an if my people, the most people possible. Then where are we going to do it? And we pray and fast over those decisions. So we, everybody stand on your post, Habakkuk 2. Listen to what he's saying. Write the vision down. It's for an appointed time, even though it seems like it's tarried. So we do a Habakkuk too. Then we come together. What's God, what's God saying? We look at the timing. What about rainy season, dry season, the weather, indoor, outdoor? We look at all those things. What are you saying, Lord? And there's never a way you can go wrong with a prayer gathering. <laughs> I mean, God wants prayer and prayer and prayer and more prayer and more prayer and much prayer and prayer and prayer that remains and prayer that bears fruit because that's our fruit, right? He wants prayer and more, as part of our fruit. And so that's not an issue. Does he want it or not? We don't have to pray.
Don't pray about something that's already in the word. Don't pray about, should I go win souls or not? He's already told us to. And somebody said, well, he's not speaking to me. And I said, well, what did you do with it? what he said last year? He was going to stop speaking if we don't obey. What did he already tell us? Are we doing anything with the commands he's already given us? And then we will hear Rhema on Logo. Rhema on Logo. And we'll hear more and more and more as we obey. So he's already told us to pray, right? So that's not even an issue. Now, when should we pray and where and how and all of that? That's what we pray about. We already know prayer. So we do prayer gatherings of any kind, any, any time, any place. And we just, we're in the government offices holding prayer here and there, you know, all over. And I know you all are doing many of that too. But I'm going to st- st- say this specifically about a national corporate prayer gathering because there's so much power in that that the devil has worked to rob us from, especially with the COVID. Let me divide and dismember them and let me shut them up. Okay, those two tactics, not to speak of annihilate. So if we're going to reverse that and come against them, we know we need corporate prayer out loud, all the things the devil tried to do, God wants the opposite of, okay, because that's just the way Satan works. So it's up to you. Then when we know the time and the place and we start fasting into that, 40 days before the event even happens, to bind the strong man, because don't you know the devil's going to fight that with all hell? It's the power against him. Confusion, division, blah, 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 obstacles, kickbacks in your home. You've got to walk in the secret place of the Most High, cover yourself with the blood, walk in the wall of fire of Zechariah too. And so, you, you know, so all of that is being understood. And then you come up with what, what are you saying for our state? You get the scriptures. That becomes your prayer guide, okay? Now, when we're inviting the city, you may be so far ahead of this in Florida that you don't have to do this. But when we work over there in towns and cities, there's a lot of religiousness. And there's a lot of territorialism amongst churches and pastors and denominations. And there's a lot of jealousy. And there's a lot of division and dispute. And there's a lot of you name it. We cannot make people united. We, you cannot create unity. But I can give you a common vision. You want your baby saved, and you want your baby saved. That's all you have to agree on. We both want. So we call it, because in Africa, wars happen, and it, they're called united in, I mean, uh, united in common hatred. I looked at this over there, and I said, how come these two tribes are killing each other, but they were allies a few years ago to overthrow the British? They said, well, they united just long enough to destroy a common enemy. And then they became enemies again. And I said, well, then God can unite us in common vision. If the devil unites us in common hatred, we can be united in common vision. So when we had that first prayer gathering, I never said anything about who's coming. I look out over the field and people and pastors that have not spoken to each other in 10 or more years, the war was in the church. They were weeping and embracing and hugging. We didn't talk about unity. We didn't say anything. We were just praying. But when the presence of God comes in like that and we go, oh, you want our, our country to be safe and you want our co- That's enough. I found you, brother, you know. And they're just we- God does supernatural things when we're all there for one vision. And it's not based on doctrine or denomination or blah, blah, blah. It's based on you want your, the youth in this, in this nation saved and freed from the crisis in the schools and identity and suicide and our babies. We want this generation. Bait. That's all we need. That's our vision. Let's go. And so when I write the letters, we write the letters and we invite all pastors and all churches and we say, would your church take one of the 40 days? And we do chains, okay? And then when we invite them, we say, there's going to be a big prayer gathering out there in the field or the stadium or whatever. And we don't tell them who's paid for it. And, and, and we pay for it. Favor pays for it, but I don't tell them. We have no name on it. We have no promotional picture. We have no face. You know, here everybody wants to know, well, who's putting that on? Well, who's running that conference? I'll see if I want to come or not. Well, who are they? I'd never heard of them. I don't think I'll go to that one. 
And it's all about people. And I thought, whoever asked if Jesus is going to be there? Where, where is his platform? And so I write a letter and I say, all the believers in the city are coming together. I say all. I'm speaking by faith. See, All the believers are coming together to pray in the stadium. And we're going to have a platform for Jesus and the word. And we want you to come. Well, the letters are all delivered around to the churches as we're praying. And the pastors are open. I'm going to go, well, who's putting this on? And who's doing this? And who's paying for it? All the believers. Who's going to be praying? All the believers. Who's going to come? All the believers. Well, I guess I better come too. <laughs> That's it. Not allowed to mention a name, a person, a title, a denomination, nothing. And we always do it in neutral territory. So I write the prayer guide. What are you going to pray for? We're going to pray for the nation. Well, who doesn't want that? And so the prayer guide is nothing but verses. It's not about the media. It's not about this or that. It's just verses. They all come. Now, when they're on their pulpit, we have instructions. You read the scriptures and then pray. No preaching. No introduction. We've had vice presidents come. And I go, nobody's going to introduce you. <laughs> You're the same as everybody else out here praying. We're all at the foot of the cross. You're not any bigwig. Parliament members, bishops come in on the roof. No introduction. And don't you dare say your name in your church. You talk Jesus and Jesus only or I'll take you right off that platform. And I never get up on that platform. I write it and I have one MC and he's a national. And if somebody starts to preach and I wish it. Get up there, Sam. And he'll tap him on the shoulder and go, would, would you start praying now? Just read the word and pray if he gets off. And he'll give him a couple taps. And if he doesn't, he'll just say, thank you so much, brother. And he'll just take the microphone and give it to the next one. I would rather offend man than God. I would rather offend man than the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit falls. And you wouldn't believe the stuff that happens 11 hours a day. Because we give God time. We give him the time. And seven days, you know, we're there. We're there for you. And, of course, as a staff and a team, we, we can go one week, two weeks, three weeks. So... That's how we do our prayer gatherings. And as a city, you have enough people even in this room, much less there's intercessory prayer networks all over the city of all different kinds, and it's wonderful. And so go to another level with corporate prayer in your church, in your personal life, in your family. Turn the television off, get everybody in, and the last hour or two hours before the day ends, say, here's our family altar. And if you don't practice it at home, you cannot preach it. You can't get out there and tell other people to do it if it doesn't start at home. And so from your per personal closet to your home, to your church, to your city, that's enough to make volcanoes erupt and turn the tide because he comes for our words. I'm going to give time for question and answer. Now, when we pray together, the way we do is we'll give a topic, and then um, I, I call it popcorn prayers. And we also have popcorn testimonies. So popcorn prayer is like we're going to say, we are going to pray for our youth. And I feel like w we need to do that. And then we're going to have some time praying for our, our government, um, uh, church leaders, and government leaders, our leaders. But let's begin with our children. They've su suffered a lot. So we give the topic. Well, worship, worshipers will, will be up here. And then when you, when you come up with a verse, everybody has to read the verse because that's the word of God. I'd rather come into agreement with him than with you. Right? We want to agree with him. That's the way that prayer is the most powerful. Because we're not going to agree with our opinion or our mind or our news or our emotions or our fear or our, nothing. That's going to change tomorrow anyway. But his word never changes. And it's, and it's the power of God unto salvation. So you read a scripture about that, about setting the, the children. You and your children shall be saved, you know. There's many, many. I can just come into my head now. Deuteronomy 6, many, many. So you read a scripture, um, not necessarily whole chapters, two, three, four verses at the most, okay? And then you just pray. And it's not a 45-minute prayer. When we're out in the stadium and we give you an hour to read the word and lead people in prayer. You can lead them in repentance, breaking covenants two by two, but praying that word, you have 30 to 40 minutes. 
But when we're in a church like this, we do popcorn, meaning you just keep it to a couple of minutes, give the other one, the other one, the other one, because we tend to want to monopolize. Well, I'm just the anointed one, you know, so we're going to, uh, oh, no, but because I want to hear what you are, have to pray more than me praying. I want to agree with you because when you pray prophetically, my spirit is edified. And, I, and it sharpens me. Iron sharpens iron. And, you, you know, you, you hear things and then you go, I'm going to pray that some more tonight. You know, I'm going to get back in my closet and intercede. And so it, it's wonderful. And we have to let the whole body, every joint supply. And so three or four or five people will take a turn and then we'll just come in on worship. And I like the way Suzette Hatting, she called it a wave. And she said, you just go with the wave. Because intercession is threefold, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the burden drops from the heart of the Father into our hearts during worship or a topic is given. And it drops in by the Holy Spirit. And we groan and pray through the Holy Spirit in agreement with Jesus who lives to make intercession and in his name back to the throne of Father. Finished. Full circle. So we're praying like that in agreement, and we just, you know, know that we know. So after we do this for these seven days when we're over there, we just walk out of there, and there's an expectancy. If a woman knows that she's conceived and going to deliver, you call her an expectant mother. And we need to become an expectant bride, that we know we have conceived and we've yielded ourselves and our spiritual womb to the presence of the Holy Spirit as he overshadowed Mary and she conceived. And we expect delivery. But that comes maybe with travailing and persistence, prevailing prayer. When Zion travails, she gives birth. So we become very expectant. We've prayed. And then if it's something doesn't happen or delays, I ask the Lord. Is, it have, is there a battle for the words? Do we need to get out the atomic bomb of fasting? Is there any doubt and unbelief in the room? I troubleshoot. Are we right in line and this is just going to take persistence? You know, ask the Lord and he'll teach you all those things. So, so we'll go that, that way with some, some popcorn prayer as we're doing that. And we did this in Anaheim and then on, it was time to have an eight-hour prayer meeting. I've not been to a church in America that said we want an eight-hour prayer meeting, and they did. And so the pastor's wondering, how are you going to keep people occupied for eight hours? We have about 500 people coming every night for seven nights. Now it's time for Saturday, the eight hour. And they were all there, four or 500 people. And I said, Lord, what do you want us to do? We've been praying the popcorn prayers and, you know, going with the waves when it breaks on the sea and you draw back in worship, you know, into the next wave and it breaks. And he said, popcorn testimonies. Because we overcome by the word of our testimony and it builds faith. So I said, we're going to do popcorn testimonies today. And it was like the first thing in the morning. They lined the wall to stand and give their testimony. And I said, popcorn. So one by one, they came up to the front. And the first one, I mean, they're so excited. Some of them are crying and squeaking. And said, I prayed and I prayed in my prodigal ca-. I said, tell us what God did this week, not 25 years ago when you got saved. We want to know fresh testimony this week because of prayer. And so she came up. My prodigal, he came. We, uh, we've been weeping. We've been fasting. Came back home this week. And so we're all rejoicing and everything. And she finishes her testimony. I said, okay, now we're going to go into prayer for the prodigals. So many of you still have one out there. All right, then the next one. Well, I was about to commit suicide. All this depression on me. God set me free. That thing lifted and broke. I'm a child of the king. I know my, I mean, you know, they're just going on. I said, oh, praise God. We're all rejoicing. Okay, now we're going to pray for the spirit of depression. And we're going to intercede for a whole generation of youth. So we turned every testimony into an intercession focus. And after eight hours, the line was still at the back of the church. And I looked at the pastor and I said, you can, you can keep going all night. But I left it up to him. 
And I think he went another hour or something. And then he said, you know, we've got service tonight. Service tonight. So I let him decide. But they would have gone all night. It wasn't stopping because people were so ecstatic at what God had done in one week's prayer meetings. And they couldn't be silent. They had to testify. So, oh, and that breaks yokes of bondage. So we are go we're going we're gonna to start and we'll take some time praying for um, pray, let's pray for our, our babies and our and the, and the youth in our city and um, not our, our nation um, suicide gender things prodigals uh, abortion trafficking violence you name it let's cry out for this and so after sing sing one or two and then the first one pop up and you, you we'll just leave the mic right there you get the mic and I know you've prayed like that before and so just read the scripture pray the next one the next one the next one and then and then I'll give you a cue about praise and worship and when people worship like this with us a, a long time they listen to the tempo of the intercession when it's worship, they're coming with a worship song. When we've been going to battle and war, man, they come right in with a war song. So you, so they, they, they just follow the tempo of the, and um, and then, yeah, amen. So I think we'll move this over to this side. Can I pick up the the, the other sheet who has that? Okay, thank you. Phone button. You're the first one to get started. And you know, I did, I, I'm sorry I forgot to do Q and A, but save them because we will, before we close, have time for some of that. meetings we don't do soaking worship music at 2 a.m. in the morning and preaching we do the dance <laughs> we do the war dance I love, I love, I 
love you, Jesus. flee when no one chases them, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Matthew 19, 14 says, but Jesus said, let the, chil let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me. 
For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. So we agree today with the words of Jesus. We come into alignment with what Jesus said. And we say, leave the children alone and allow them to come to him. We say now in the name of Jesus, children, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus all across this land. We call the children into Jesus now. And we say to the enemy, to the government, to those who have wicked schemes, leave the children alone. According to the word, you leave the children alone now and we call the children in we call a uh, hedge of protection over the children and we call plead the blood of Jesus over our children across this nation in Jesus name we say leave the children alone and let them come to Jesus now in Jesus name Thank you, Jesus. and it shall be in the last day says God that I'll pour out my spirit upon all mankind and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see divinely prompted visions, and your old men shall dream divinely prompted dreams. Even on your maidservant, both your men and your women, I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. So, Father God, we agree with heaven. Lord, and we call even, even these children, God, and we call these youth, God, we call them into fullness of your spirit, God. We call them into dreams and visions of you, God, even as they lay their heads on their pillows, God, that you would invade their dreams, God, and that you would bring even salvation and healing and deliverance on them, even during the dreams. And God, we call forth their destiny and we speak to them in Jesus' name and we say, line up and get in line with the destiny of the kingdom of God upon your life now in Jesus' name. And we call every prodigal home in the name of Jesus. We say come home now in Jesus name. It's time to run to the Father, run to the Father, run to the Father. Hear the sound of the Father calling you home now in Jesus name. In Jesus name. Invade their dreams, oh God. Invade their visions. Invade even, Lord, just invade their thoughts. Let them hear you. Let them hear you. Let them hear you. Let no one despise your youth, but set an example to those who believe in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Father, we declare and decree that the children and the youth of this nation, Father, Lord, are going to lead. That, Father God, they're going to set an example to those that believe. They're going to set an example, Father Lord, by living by your word. Father, allowing every word that proceeds from the very mouth and the heartbeat of God to be able to flow through them. That, Father, they will set an example to this nation, Father God, in conduct, in love. Father Lord, may the love of God penetrate their hearts, penetrate their minds, penetrate their souls. That, Father God, they're going to set an example in spirit. That, Father, they'll be led by the Holy Spirit. That, Father Lord, they will... Father, Lord, demonstrate, Father, with signs and wonders and miracles that, Father, Lord, they will hear your voice and not follow the voice of the stranger. That, Father, they're going to set an example by faith, faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, Father, Lord, they will set an example in purity. They will be pure of heart. Father, Lord, they will live pure lives. And that, Father, God, they will let your light so shine forth in the darkness. In Jesus' name. But Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And I just say right now, let the Holy Spirit flow through their homes. The Holy Spirit is the same size in little children as it is in adults. We just say, let that spirit flow in their homes and let them know they are a child of God, that they can freely pray. We say, open up the school to prayer again. Bring prayer again. That the little children may pray in preschool, in kindergarten, in elementary, in their high schools. That they will pray and that they, they will lead. That the teachers will pray. That the administrative and staff will pray. And all the schools from preschool to high school through colleges will be transformed into kingdom of heaven prayer life. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Jesus. We pray into their true identities. Roman 9, 8 says, this means 
that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but children of the promise are counted as offspring. So, Lord, we pray deception off false identities, Lord, that they are walking in. We pray it off of them, Lord. We pray that their true identities would just burst forth, Lord, in ways like never before. People who are doubting, Lord, the spirit of confusion, the spirit of just things that are not true about them, Lord. We pray the truth would set them free, that their identity is that they are grafted in as children of offspring. We pray this would be brought forth in them, Lord. Please, Jesus, we pray the deception off in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It says there's no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears has not been reached, has not reached perfection of love. We love because he first loved us, God. We bind that spirit of fear off our youth, God. They've been made to be so afraid these last couple of years, God. Fear of this and fear of that, God. God, we call for the destruction of the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. We ask God for an invasion. We declare, we declare an invasion of your love. And the youth, God, in this city, in this state, in this nation. God, we declare an invasion, an army of love, God, in Jesus' name. To come and round up this youth, God, this youth, God, this children, this youth. God, and destroy these spirits in the name of Jesus. To thank you that, Lord, we can love. They can love because you first loved them. And we proclaim that in Jesus' name. Praise God. Psalm 127, starting in 3. Behold, children are a heritage and gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. We are blessed and fortunate to have our quivers full of them. We'll not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies at the, at the city gate. Father, we just lift up parents in Jesus' name. I've taught in the schools for years, Lord God, and I was not ashamed to pray with children, for I knew it was a mission from heaven above. And I thank you, Lord, for awakening parents who are not in churches, who are not in the word, Lord. Give them the holy boldness to speak to their children about you, to train them up in the way they should go, and then they will not worry about what they do when they grow old but they will follow you they will continue in the way they've been trained in jesus name amen proverbs eleven twenty one: evil people will surely be punished but the children of the godly will go free father god we heard today the stories that we heard is that you even love the evil people, the ones who are oppressed by Satan, the, the naked guy, the crazy guy, the, the get, you know, I think of the gang leaders in Tallahassee. Their children should go free too. All the children in the gang that are looking for a father figure that joined the gang to get a father are looking for the wrong father. They need to go free too. So we pray for all the children of the godly and even of the evil people that also need saving. We pray for all the children, Lord. All of them have your coverage, your love, your peace, your comfort, and most of all, your salvation. In Jesus' name. Proverbs 31, 28. Her children rise up and bless her. Father, in the name of Jesus, we break this rebellion. We break this mindset that's been put upon our children that they do not honor their parents in the name of Jesus. We break that lie. We break that stronghold. We break that rebellion upon our children that they do not honor us as their parents. Father, in the name of Jesus, we stop that thing. We cancel the cancel culture that throws out the parents. We stop it in the name of Jesus. We cancel the plans and schemes of the government that says your children are mine. We cancel it in the name of Jesus and we declare and we decree that her children will rise up and call her blessed in Jesus' name.
And Malachi 4 says, He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. So we agree right now as a father, as a grandfather, to restore my heart that my children's hearts may be restored. For we call for restoration of every child's heart. Every child, Lord God, that needs to have that father's heart towards them, to have that father. Father, we call in that father's heart for the children. Lord God, let us all, everyone, man, woman, and person here, Lord God, have a father's heart for the children and let the children receive, Lord God, that love from the fathers, Lord God, to bring wholeness, to bring healing, Lord God, to bring restoration, to bring deliverance, that we will not have fatherless children, but we have a children, Lord God, that see you as their great father, the father of all fathers that receive your love. We call for children, Lord God, to recognize they have a father, even if they're fatherless in the natural, Lord God, they have the great father, and we speak, Lord God, restoration to their hearts now in Jesus' name. Healing, restoration, deliverance to the children's hearts that they will know, Lord God, that they're accepted. They will know that they are loved. They will know that you are there for them in the name of Jesus. The Word says that um, He hadn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Yeah. So, Lord, and He also says in 1 Corinthians, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So, Father God, even in the LT, LG... Yep, in that. God, that all confusion. Lord, we, we just speak life and health and wholeness. We speak wholeness and the healing power of the Holy Spirit all over those broken, broken, broken individuals. God, heal their hearts. Show yourself strong on their behalf. Wake them up. Wake them up. Give them a sound mind, God. We call forth a sound mind. We say you don't have a spirit of fear and a spirit of woundedness and a spirit of trauma. We say a sound mind. We say a healed mind. We say a healed and whole yeah. spirit. We say you are healed and whole. We call you to wholeness in Jesus' name. To sound mind. To sound mind. To sound mind. Healed and whole. We take authority over that anger. That anger that would rise up. Oh, God, that you would heal and restore and set free. Set free, God. We thank you that you're the healer. You're the restorer. You're the deliverer. Lord, there are people in this very room, oh, God, that we are standing on your word for prodigals. We are standing on your word for rightly identified children. Rightly identified family members, rightly identified kids, and God, we ask you to intervene. We say intervene, 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 intervene. So calm down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. Hey. Isaiah 49. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you, Lord, and you have not forgotten any of your children, Lord. And we thank you that you're a good, good God, and you do not forget us, Lord. And we just pray for all the children. We pray for, for those who are lost, those who need you, Lord. We just pray that for each one to be saved in Jesus name thank you Lord Isaiah 8:18 8, <laughs> Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me we are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. 
And Father, we pray for these children who have a false identity. They don't know that they are to be signs and wonders in your kingdom and a light in a dark world. So we call each of you the children that the Lord has given us, spiritually or, or physically. We call you forth into the light, into your destiny, into that which he has ordained from you before you were even conceived. We call forth destiny. We break off deception in the name of Yeshua, our King and our God and the Father of all fathers, that you may know him as Father. All of our children will be taught of the Lord and great will be the peace of our children. I call back all the prodigals. Lord, you showed me a tractor beam on our kids that used to know you, Father God, and I ask that you pull that tractor beam in that they will come back to you, Father, in Jesus' name. This year, Father, in Jesus' name. Proverbs 11.21 says, The children of the righteous shall be delivered. Ooh. This is what I pray over my prodigals. God knows how to deliver them. I will do my part and trust him to do his. He will bring them back from the land of the enemy. I break the power of darkness over their lives in Jesus' name. Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord. And they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. That's Jeremiah 31, 16, 17. We were taught a long time ago that shall is not just will. Shall is shall. And we stand on the promises of God. And as she said, today is the bride waiting for our bridegroom. We are the helpmeet. And these are our children. Holy Spirit. Train up a child, Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So we, the Ecclesia, join our prayers together to pray for parents across our nation, across this state of Florida, across this county of Leon and Jefferson and Gadsden. We call the parents not to buy into the woke agenda but to awaken and in fact we bind the hand of the enemy is trying to hijack the awakening and make it woke that's a perversion of this movement and we come against it in the name of Jesus we call for parents to be sensible to seek the Lord and how they should raise their children to to cleave to biblical values and the biblical standard of how to raise their children, to take back the family altar from that coffee table and that TV room, to take it back and to raise their children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, not buying in to anything that's perverse or an abomination to the Lord. So, Father, we give you glory for that. We thank you that we are in agreement with you. This is your will. We are in agreement with you. 
with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a threefold cord that will never be broken. And we are in agreement. We come along with you, O oh Lord, as you're leading the way. And we thank you for saving our children and for helping parents, guiding them to raise them in ways that they will flourish before you, that they will carry your standard, oh God. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Joel chapter 2, and it shall come to pass that I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall have dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And Father, we come into agreement with Joel chapter 2, and we declare, God, that you're pouring your spirit out upon all flesh. That, Father God, you're pouring your spirit out upon your sons and your daughters, and that they will prophesy. That, Father Lord, they will speak the word of the Lord, that Father, they will boldly declare the truth of your word and set the captives free. Father, I declare and decree that Father Lord, that your young men, Father Lord, will see visions. That Father God, they will be led by your spirit. They will allow the fullness of the power of the glory of God to so infiltrate their hearts, be led by their spirit to begin to move inside of the land. Father Lord, we just declare and decree that you're raising up an army of young men and young women that Father God will take this land by force. That, Father, they will not sit back. They will not be weak. They will not be wishy-washy. They will have a backbone of steel. They will stand for righteousness. And they will see the power and the glory of Almighty God cover the land just like the waters cover the sea. I wanted to reemphasize Isaiah 54, 13. I will teach all your children. And they will enjoy great peace, shalom, and you will be secure under a government that is just and fair. And we come against the unjust in this government. We command the wicked to be removed from our government, and those in righteousness will remain in positions of authority in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. John 10.10, 10. a thief, a thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come to have life and have it more abundantly. The thief has come to steal the identity of America, and that's why it trickles down to steal the identity of our children. So we call back, first of all, the identity, the identity of our nation. We remember the covenants of old, Lord God, in Jesus' name. The covenants of John Hunt, uh, Robert Hunt, and others, God. Even the Constitution, Lord God, in Jesus' name. We call forth that covenant, Lord God, that we will remember who we are in this nation. And the enemy will not steal the identity of this nation, the identity of our children anymore in Jesus' name. We call forth, thief, give it up, give it up, give it up, give up our nation give up our children. We call our kids back to the identity that the Lord Jesus Christ has called them to be. This nation, our children, will be born again, is being born again, again. We claim it, Lord. We seal it with the blood that you shed for us in Jesus' name. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us, come rest on us, as the Spirit was moved over the water, Spirit come move over us, come rest on us, come rest on us, come down, Spirit when you move you make my heart.
Ezekiel 11. Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you. This is to the children. I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you from the countries where you've been scattered. And I will bring you back to the land. And they will go there and they will take away all the detestable things and the abominations from there. And I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them. I will take out the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments to do them. And they shall be, I decree this, they shall be my people and I will be their God. First John 2, 12. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. So we just declare over the children, your sins have been forgiven, and we declare that shame is broken off of you. Condemnation is broken off of you. We declare that those things that have held you back from entering into the fullness of his righteousness, we break those things off of you now, and we call you into that righteousness of Jesus right now to receive the righteousness that he has paid for you. And we break off everything that hinders you, every word, every hurt, every trauma, every shame, all condemnation all fear, all rejection, all abandonment. We break those things off of you now in the name of Jesus. And we release the love of God to you. We release the salvation of Jesus to you. His righteousness is there for you to receive. And we just declare now, Lord, to just have the children begin to reach out. Have the children across this nation begin to cry out for you in the name of Jesus. To cry out for Jesus and say, I'm coming to you no matter what. I'm coming to you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. The scriptures say, I believe it was J. Iris came to Jesus. And he said, my girl is sick. Then people came and said, no, she's dead. And Jesus says, no, she is not dead. She is only sleeping. So boldly we say, Lord Jesus, that prodigals, our children, our grandchildren, some of them are just sleeping. They are not dead. They are not dead in Jesus' name. Jesus will come into their rooms and raise them from their sleep. Holy Spirit, go to our prodigals. Go to our daughters. Go to our sons. Go to our children. We boldly proclaim they will arise with you. Psalm 51, Lord God, unlock my heart, unlock my lips, and I will overcome with my joyous praise. And so, Lord, we call forth the, the, the keys that unlock hearts, that unlock the hearts of these kids, God. We call forth even the keys to unlock the kingpin, the cosmos, those that would be those that would lead others out. So, Father, we call forth the keys. We call forth that you would even highlight kingpins, Lord, that you would highlight that which everything pivots around in the gang. Every, every, All these things were the one that it all pivots around, God. We call that one into the kingdom in Jesus' name. We say highlight them, pinpoint them for kingdom purpose in Jesus' name. So we call them in, we call them in, we call in every kingpin. We, we break open the heart, so oh God, and we ask that you put the key in the heart and that you unlock, that they would be those that would praise, they would be those that would worship you, they'd be those that would go in and bring them out, they'd be those that would go in and be the deliverer, they'd be, Lord, we call forth the Moses, Lord, we call them forth from this generation, God, we call forth the Moses. say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. 
naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Father God, there are so many in our land who are hungry, hungry physically, hungry for you. There are so many, Lord, who don't have families, who don't have homes. There are so many, Lord, in prison, sick. Father God, there are so many flooding into our country through the southern border. Lord, they're precious, precious souls, and you love them. Lord, teach us to love the way you love. Teach us to feed the way you feed. Teach us to clothe the way you clothe. Teach us to heal the way you heal. Teach us to love and visit the, those in prison, Lord. I just ask for your mercy, Lord, and teach us to see these precious, precious ones the way you see them. Help us to open our homes, literally open our homes to those who need a place to live. Teach us to open our country to those who need a safe place to live, Lord. Teach us to love the way you love. Thank you, Jesus. Acts 19 says many of those who believed now came openly and confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their skulls together and scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So, Lord, we just break off any powers of witchcraft that have tried to infiltrate the minds of young children through the Internet, unknowingly through television, through secular music, Jesus, through these crystals, through TikTok, Lord, the trends that look so crafty and cunning and seductive, Lord. They are lies, and we know that they are deceiving and seducing young people unknowingly, Lord. So, Lord, we pray for your strong men and women to rise up, to break these off children. Lord, that you would just protect their eyes, protect their ears, Lord. We just break off these strongholds of witchcraft that are trying, Lord, to just take root and just destroy. So we just pray in agreement, Lord, that we will know the enemy and we will say, flee from their phones, flee from their bedside, flee from their minds, Jesus. Flee from all these things, Lord, that are trying to just take over, Lord. So we pray, Lord, that, that they would just find behind Bibles, that they would fall out of the sky and like manna God we pray God that a word would come to them that the radio stations would just change supernaturally to Christian music Lord to your truth Jesus Lord we believe we believe you can do these things and that and as repentance comes that they would burn up the witchcraft the tarot cards that they are playing with the parties God I know they're doing it Lord we pray that they would surrender their vapes we pray they would surrender all these things Lord that are keeping them ensnared and we thank you in advance in Jesus name Proverbs 6, 16, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, first thing, for overturning Roe versus Wade. But, Lord, we say now, 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 not just a heartbeat, Bill. Lord, we need it done. We need it gone. We're calling the end to abortion. We're calling the end to this murder. We're calling it. You hate it, Lord. You hate it. Lord, we need to hate what you hate. Father, you hate it. Father, we call an end to it. We say Planned Parenthood is closed in the name of Jesus. It is outlawed in the name of Jesus. And we call an end that every state will not just pass little bills, but they will have the guts to say it's murder, it's done, it's over in the name of Jesus. We call forth the ecclesia, your people, and your authority with covenantal authority. We call the end to abortion in America in the name of Jesus. Matthew 19, 14. And Yeshua said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Father, there has been an identity crisis for our children. But you, your son, there has been an identity crisis. They have been presented a false Christ. They have been presented sometimes abuse in the very place that is called your house. Lord, instead of many of our churches being houses of prayer, Lord, there has been 
atrocities committed in your name, Lord. So many things have been done to our young people, Father, and they don't even know who Yeshua is. Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the one whose Father loves them with an incredible, unbelievable love. And so, Father, we pray that the mask of the true Yeshua would be ripped off and, and that they would see him as the true Savior, as the one who died for them, the one who called them. Let them come to me, he said, not to a false religion, not to drugs, not to sex, not to the internet, not to a gang, but to me. Lord, reveal yourself to them, whether it's in their dreams, uh, in, in a vision, Lord, however you do it. Father, you are supreme, and these children come unto you, for this is the kingdom of heaven. I'm reading from 1 John 3, 7. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. So, Father God, I ask you to remove the blinders from their eyes. Take the scales off their eyes. Open their ears, Lord. Lord, give them discernment at an early age. Yeah. We cancel the spirit of deception. We say the spirit of discernment pour into these children that they do see what is right and that they are drawn by the Holy Spirit in them to what is right. They will know what is right and what is wrong. And we thank you, Father, that you do help your little children. You do do this when we ask and pray. Amen. I saw Satan fall like lightning And I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven And I believe in signs and wonders And I have resurrection power Yes, I do Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Yes, my praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the right This is my testimony. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Wake up. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead. You're not done. You're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead. You're not done. No, no. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe my best days are up ahead. This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony For it was an act worthy of God and fitting to the divine nature that he whose sake and by whom all things have their existence in bringing many sons into glory should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect and should bring to maturity 
the human experience necessary to be perfectly equipped for his office as high priest through suffering. And Lord God, we thank you that you're bringing sons and daughters to yes. glory. And we stand in the gap and we declare it. And Lord, as you bring in birth, birth a generation, birth out of the womb of your bride, birth out of the belly of the church, the sons and the daughters that you're bringing into glory in this great harvest and great awakening. We ask you, Lord, for the spiritual mothers and fathers to nurture them. We ask, Lord, that you would raise the rest of the bride that's been asleep to take their stand, to, ha to give the spirit of adoption to those in the streets, those broken, those homeless. And Lord, give your bride the heart of the father, not the hireling, but the shepherd's heart that we would be true mothers and fathers after your heart, that we would know how to disciple, how to love, how to nurture, how to deliver, how to mentor the next generation as they begin pouring in. Lord, bring these sons to glory. These are the sons and daughters for which we have prayed. And we believe you to do it. We believe you to do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We can transition now even into praying. Let's start focusing now on the government leaders and the church leaders. Hallelujah. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to try you. My God will never fail. My God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the
2 Kings 22. Josiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right nor to the left. Father, we just declare and decree that you're bringing integrity back, Father Lord, to our branches of government. Father, to our executive, our legislative, and our judicial government. Father, we declare, God, that, Father, you're causing integrity to be able to come back into this land. That you're bringing, Father Lord, integrity into these offices. That, Father, they will do what is right with inside of your sight. So, Father, we pray for these branches of government right now. And, Father, we release the power of the Holy Spirit, Father Lord, to begin to minister to them. Even when they couch their head on a pillow this night to be able to sleep. Father God, may you encounter them in their dreams. Father, I declare and decree that there is a shift that's happening over our nation. There's a shift that's happening, Father Lord, over our government. And that, Father God, this government will come back to one nation under God. Yeah. This government will recognize yes. that the strength of who they are is not found in the power that they wield, but is found in the bended knee that they would submit themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father Lord, just like Josiah, Father Lord, I pray it over this nation, and I declare and decree that they will return back to the God of their fathers, that this will be one nation under God. Ephesians 4.11 And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Father, we call forth the government of the church to begin to arise to a new level. Father, we call forth those that are called to lead the church, Lord God. These five ascension gifts that Jesus gave to the church to lead and equip the church. We begin to call them forth to arise to a new level. To that new level of integrity as it's just been prayed. But also to a new level, Lord God, of love for the body. To a new level of servanthood, Lord God. Lord, that they're called as servants, not as kings. For that we call forth five-fold ministers, Lord God, to begin Begin to serve and lead by example, Lord God. To lead out, Lord God, that people begin to see, Lord God. And there begin to be a shift that we can see the unity of the body of Christ begin to come together the way it's ordained to be for the very purpose, Lord God, that it will bring glory to your name, Lord God. Lord, that it will bring and establish your kingdom on this earth, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Father, we call forth every person that's been called to a five-fold office to begin to arise in purity, begin to arise in dedication, begin to arise, Lord God, in righteousness and wholeness and healing, to begin to arise and move out in the fullness of the gifts that they've been called to in the name of Jesus. Father, we speak a release, Lord God, over five-fold ministry, Lord God, the government of the church arise in the name of Jesus. Arise and be led by your head in the name of Jesus. Lord, we call it forth now in Jesus' name. Isaiah 3, 6. A man will seize one of his brothers in his father's house and say, You have a cloak. You be our leader. Take charge of this heap of ruins. Lord, I ask this for all of our leaders in our region, in our, in our city, in our region, in our county, in our government, in our churches, to take charge when they see the heap of ruins around them and just have a love for the people, the people in their city, the people in their county, and they become united, that they unite together, that the leaders of church, of churches in this county, in this region, unite together with a common goal to look at that heap of ruins and say, this is my city, this is my region, this is my state, these are my people, and I will fight for them in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to encourage you guys, let's keep pressing in. Come on, let's keep pressing in. Let's keep pressing in. Let's keep pressing in. The enemy, they've been calling evil good and good evil. That's got to stop. We got to be the ones that say, no, that's evil. That's not good. Second Chronicles 20, he's talking to the judges. Because our judges are calling a lot of good evil lately. So we speak this to the judges in America. 
I don't care if you got a D or an R by your name because God's in charge. Then he said to the judges, and we're speaking this to our judges, consider what you are doing. For you do not judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you in the matter of judgment. Consider, judges, what you're doing because you're a judge for God. And now may the terror of the Lord be on you. Watch what you do, for there's no injustice or partiality or taking bribes with the Lord our God. So, God, we speak this to the judges in this nation, from the, from the county judges to the state judges, God, to the national judges. We speak to you. You be careful what you're doing because you judge for God. You don't judge for man. And, Lord, we ask right now that those who do take bribes, those who do injustice, and those who judge by partiality, Lord God, that the terror of the living God will fall upon them even tonight, Lord. God, that you release a terror of the living God upon them, Lord. Dreams, visions, whatever needs to be done, Lord God, that they will tremble before you and repent, just like Nebuchadnezzar did, Lord God, at the end of that, of uh, being like a beast, Lord. God, we speak the terror of the Lord upon them to bring them to repentance and to judge righteously in Jesus' name. Daniel chapter 2. It is he who changes the times and periods. He removes kings and appoints kings. He gives wisdom to the wise men and knowledge to people of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. For you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Father, in the name of Jesus, first I lift up those in the body of Christ who watched what's happened over the last couple years and they've been so discouraged. They've despaired. They've wanted to give up, but they don't know. They don't even know this word, Lord, that it's you. It's you, and it doesn't matter who's sitting in the seat. You're still God. You don't get up off your throne for nobody. Father, we pray encouragement to the body of Christ right now. We pray encouragement for those who have been struck down by the lies and all the deception. But, Father, you raised up a Daniel. Daniel was a captive. He was a slave. He was a captive, and you used him to speak to the king. Father, I'm calling forth those voices. I'm calling forth the, the voices to begin to speak to the people people in government, to our city commissioners, to our county commissioners, to our mayor, to our uh, to all of the authorities in Florida, to all of the authorities in our government, that, Lord, you're going to begin to raise up Daniels, Daniels that are going to begin to, they're not going to be able to solve their problems. They're not going to be able to understand, but, Lord, you're going to raise up men and women of God. They're going to speak life to them, going to speak truth to them, going to reveal the hidden things, for, Lord, you are revealing the hidden things, Father, and we pray pray for these people, Lord God. We pray and we know that you allow things, and but you also disallow things. Father, we know you're changing and you're shifting and what we've even seen over the last few years has made way for what we're living in. The great third great awakening and we thank you for it Lord God but we're asking you to raise these people up begin to listen to Lord I, I pray a desperation and a desperation in every government official that they go I don't know I don't know I don't know but Lord you will send a godly person to speak the truth Lord in Jesus name oh we thank you Jesus Ephesians 3.10 says, His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities, authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, Lord, we just... The church has had an identity crisis. She does not know her true authority, Lord. Lord, we pray this off of her in Jesus' name, and we pray that you'd purify the church leaders first. Lord, let them not have shame, condemnation. Let them repent, Jesus. Let all of those things fall quickly, just like Carol was talking about. In a moment, he can heal a wound. In a moment, he can set things free. Let this happen quickly, Lord. Let pride not get in the way, Lord. Let the, let the church leaders be purified so that the people can see the glory of the Lord go out. We know this to be true. We just rebuke this identity crisis, Lord, that we need the church to be unified so that she will walk in her witness to the world. 
We just rebuke this over her, God. Call her back. Remind her who she is in you, Jesus. We claim this and that she will walk in her true authority, which will call all the sons and daughters home faster than any of us ever could on our own. And we thank you and we are asking expectantly for you to show us how to do this. Please purify the leaders, Lord, and let us not get in the way. John 17, I pray that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and that the glory which you gave me, I give it unto them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may, may be made perfect in one. Father, Lord, I pray, God, for, for the church. I pray for pastors, Father, all over this region, all over the state, over this nation, and over this world. And, Father, Lord, I pray, God, for the spirit of, of oneness, Father, Lord, to be able to come upon them. Father, your word says in, one, in Psalms 133 that it is there, Father, Lord, through unity that the blessing is commanded. So, Father, Lord, right now, God, we repent, Father, Lord, of competitiveness. Father, Lord, we repent, Father, Lord, of selfishness, self-centeredness. Father, Lord, we're trying to draw people to ourselves instead of to you. And Father, I declare and decree that, Father Lord, that pastors all over this world are bowing their knees, especially yeah. in this panhandle region, especially yeah. in this state of Florida, and especially in this nation. They're bowing their knee to the greater one. They're choosing to be able to say, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Yeah. They're choosing to be able to recognize, Father Lord, their gifting is to be able to equip your people to be able to do what you've called them to do. Yeah. So, Father, I declare and decree that no longer will pastors hold people back. No longer will they just try to draw them to themselves. But, Father, they will equip them. They will re release them so that the, the harvest may be brought in and the souls would be saved. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, God, make them one. Make us one just as you are one. I'm, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. First Timothy um, 2 1. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. So, Father, that's what we're doing today, and we're asking you to help them. Help the church leaders, Father God. Father God, you know if they need to be there or they don't need to be there. You also know that about government leaders. But first of all, we're calling you to help them. And, Father God, call those who aren't even in position now. You know where they are. You're preparing people for pastor positions and five-fold ministry. You're preparing people for governmental positions. And we thank you for that. And we thank you that you are bringing in the third great awakening with transformation and freedom and peaceful, quiet lives. And he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For, for the training of the saints in the work of ministry. 
to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we'll no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way unto him which is the head, Christ Jesus. From him the whole body fitted in it together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for working of itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. God, I want to ask forgiveness for the body of Christ in America. God, we're spitting out children. Spiritual children, day in and day out. God, I ask forgiveness for that. I repent on behalf of the church in America, Lord. And God, I pray for now the ecclesia, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, the thumbs, the innards, the toes, the noses, the eyes, the ears, the hair. We'll grow together in unity in you. And we will be the example to the world that we're to be to be that we are to be because we're growing together maturity and in unity no jealousy no envy no strife in Jesus name so God we call the ecclesia in America rise up be the mature body the mature body that we are to be that we can be the example to the world that we are to be for government comes from God it doesn't come from the world Government comes from God. We are to be the witness and the example. So, God, I thank you for doing this, Lord. It begins with us, and it begins now. And we thank you for that, Lord. We speak it. We declare it in Jesus' name. God is love. Father God, I pray in your love to the body of Christ. Because your power works through your love. Without your love, there is nothing. We are nothing. We can do nothing. We have nothing. We are nothing. So, Lord, I ask you to pour your love out into the body of Christ. Father God, that people, that's how we're going to bring the children in. They've been rejected. They've been abused. And I'm talking about grown children and little children. Father God, in your love, cast out all fear. And your love heals. And your love, Father God, will restore this nation through the body of Christ. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I just felt I want to switch directions for just a, a few more minutes. And um, what you saw in those videos there of the prayer... We call that concert prayer. And when we go into concert prayer, God can just, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit broods. And when the Holy Spirit broods, he, he creates. So sometimes we go two by two and stir up the gift within one another as you saw them walking. Sometimes it's like this. It's the prayer of agreement uh, in how the Lord leads. And then sometimes we do concert prayer. Um, and the reason it's good to be able to move from one to another and flow is because when you have 11 hours to pray, you want to keep people engaged. And so, um, so we just flow from one to the other, and it activates the gift, and it keeps, keeps each one engaged. So I want us to take this next season, and we're going to go into concert. So if you'll get your, your Bibles, your swords, and uh, we always say we, didn't, we never go to battle sitting. Never seen a soldier with the armor on sitting down. So you can, if you need to be on your knees or on your face, but most of the time we're walking. And so everybody's going to stand. And we're going to go into this next season and cry out and cry out. I teach on crying out. There's power in crying out when you lift your voice. And it's beyond uh, dignity. It's beyond uh, everything. You know, you're just crying out. God begins to baptize us with the spirit of desperation. But if we don't cry out for it, if you've heard, if there's a crying baby in the house that's screaming for food, nobody sleeps. 
And that's the same with the Lord. I mean, heaven comes to attention when his children cry out. And some people say, well, I'm not desperate. Well, I said, cry out till you get desperate. You know, keep feeding yourself till you get desperate. There is something in the medical field, and let me say this, and it's called failure to thrive. And it's a medical diagnosis. And when a baby is nursing and the mama doesn't know how much milk the baby is getting, then um, that baby may not be getting enough. And so the, the strength gets weaker, the suck gets weaker, and the baby becomes very quiet because there's no hunger pains anymore. There's no gastric juices flowing. And I've watched babies come in and they're dead in the mother's arms. And she's weeping because she doesn't know how the baby died. But if they are still alive, then we can treat the diagnosis of failure to thrive by force feeding. And so we put a tube down and we pump milk in little at a time until the hunger pains come again. And we have got to get to that place in our nation where our hunger pains have returned. And where we're not just hungry, but we're desperate. And that comes because of force feeding and force prayer. We even say we go, they joke and say we would go street witnessing by force. You know, it's kind of like you get the witch doctors, you get saved or else. Get out of the town. And, and, and not that I teach people to do that, but sometimes they do that. And people say, I'd rather get saved and be on the good side than, you know, than leave town. So we pump that in. And the power of crying out. Isaiah 32, cry out. Cry out in the streets. I'm going to ask the, if the praisers or the worshipers could come and just worship quietly behind us while we do that <clears throat> in the background. Get some verses. <clears throat> he said, when you rend your hearts, I'll rend the heavens. And so when we lift up our voices and we cry out, God will give us and baptize us with a spirit of desperation where we will not be silent. Isaiah 62. So we're going to pray for a little bit for this, and we're going to cry out for revival. You cry out for personal revival, for home revival, for family revival, for revival in the church. Holy Spirit, come. We're hungry. We're desperate. We're sick and tired of everything but you. And we just want you. And we're going to lift our voices corporately and just do this for just a little bit. If, if, uh, if, we st if they're still with us, if, you if it's okay. You all worship behind us or whatever you want to do. So get your word, get your scriptures and promises of the outpouring of the spirit. Rend the heavens and come down. You can pace, you can walk. But I want everybody just lifting their voices collectively as we cry out. Thank you for the promise, Lord. Thank you for the promise of your spirit we read in Joel. Praise you for the rending of the heavens, Lord. Make us a desperate people. Make us desperate, Lord, without nothing else except for you, Lord. There's no plan B. May we rend our hearts, oh God, as you rend the heavens. Lord Jesus, may we not settle for less than what you said we could have. May we not settle for less, oh Lord. We ask you to do it, Lord. We ask you not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, Lord. You promised, Lord, that if your children would cry out, you would hear us, Lord. You promised, Lord, that you would hear us. You promised, Lord, for baptisms of righteousness, baptisms of holiness, baptisms of the fear of the Lord. We thank you that only you can do what no man can do. Move us in or move us out, Lord. Move us in or move us out. But, Lord, we want to see your glory. We want to see your glory cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. <laughs> we want to be more desperate for you, Lord, than we are for food. More desperate for you than we are for sleeping. More desperate than entertainment. More desperate, Lord, than the cares and the pleasures of the world. We want to be more desperate for you. We ask you for a baptism of desperation upon Florida, upon America, a tsunami of desperation, 
a tsunami of cleansing, a washing of the water of the word, Lord, that we go back to our first love. We come back to the foundations of truth, Lord. We've turned every man to his own way. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us, to turn us again, to turn us, Lord, and we shall be turned. Heal us and we shall be healed, Lord. Restore us and we shall be restored. Deliver us and we shall be delivered, Lord. This is your nation and your covenant-keeping God. We come back to the covenant of our forefathers. We come back to the covenant of first love. We come back to the covenant of the bride, Lord. Oh, we are not slaves of sin. We are not slaves of fear, Lord. We are children of the Most High. Make us the ambassadors that you've created us to be. The light, Lord. The salt, Lord. For we have lost our flavor. Return again the flavor of salt. Return again the saltiness of the bride. He tarara shoro kora tarara ba. He ta karara handa la ba sanda kashi. He ra karara ra 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 ba. He ra karara ra 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 ba kuro ro ro ko. Ho ra karara ra 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 ba. Ho ra karala la ba siti ki shoro kora ra 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 ka. He ra karala la 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 ba ha ra 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 ka. Give us visions and revelations of your calling and of your intimacy. Lord, give us visions and revelations of your intimacy, of what your heart bleeds for and beats for, of what your yearning is, Lord Jesus. Let your glory cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Let your glory cover the earth, Lord, as the waters cover the sea, Father God. We are not our own. We're bought with the price. We're yours. We're yours, Lord. We're yours, Father God. We're yours. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, to repossess what belongs to you. Repossess what belongs to you. Repossess what belongs to you. Healed and whole, body, soul, and spirit. Lord, cause us to be desperate. Cause families to be desperate. Fathers to be desperate. Mothers to be desperate. Desperate enough, Lord Jesus, that we become lovers of God. More than lovers of self. More than lovers, Lord Jesus, of pleasure. More than lovers of entertainment.
Praise you, Jesus. 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 Praise you, Lord. Turn us into instruments of revival, Lord. Turn us into branding instruments. As you said in Zechariah 3, that you plucked Joshua out of the fire and you're going to use him as a brand. Use us as a fire brand for nations, Lord. Use us as a fire brand for generations to brand those around us with revival, to mark them, Lord, as your possession, holiness unto the Lord. Use us, Lord, to be the fire upon the altars, Lord. We want the fire upon the altars, as Leviticus 6.13 says, that will never, never go out. And then we want the fire in our mouth, as Jeremiah said, and in our bones. So we cannot keep silent. We can't be still. Lord God, we ask that you would remove such prayerlessness from the church. That whatever it takes, make our beds burn under our bodies till we get up at night and begin to cry out at night as watchmen upon the wall in the night season. Whatever it takes, Lord, remove from us the pleasures of the world. Remove from us, Lord, that we, as you said in the last days, it would be lovers of themselves, lovers of entertainment and pleasure and lovers of money instead of lovers of God. Lord, remove from us. The love for everything else except for you, Lord. That, Lord, we would love you first and then we would love like you. And we would love one another. Deliver us, Lord. Deliver us from half-heartedness, complacency, coldness, lukewarmness. <clears throat> Deliver us from ourselves, Lord. Deliver us from uncrucified flesh. Deliver us, Lord. And let us come back to our first love. From that intimacy to live with intercession. And to see your church not only walk intercession, but walk interception. And Lord, divert, destroy, and cut off the plan of the enemy. Lord, we've lost time. Show us how to redeem the time. Show us how to wake up for the night is coming. When no man shall work any longer. And Lord, we don't want to be like the five virgins. Let their oil run out. But, Lord, we want to have our lamps fully burning, <clears throat> occupying. Find us occupying when you come. In the name of Jesus, make us expectant with, pregnant with expectancy, Lord, to where we're making preparation for the baby. We're making preparation for the harvest. We're making preparation for the nets that we're going to drag into the boat. Boat sink and harvest, Lord. Boat sink and harvest. Lord, thank you, Jesus, that that's what you gave Peter. And he had to call in the other boats to help him. May our nets be ready. May we be instant in season and out of season, Lord. May we lift up our eyes unto the hills from whence comes our help. May we lift up our eyes to see the face of the king. And may we lift up our eyes to see fields that are white unto harvest. And, Lord, we just thank you for the wisdom and downloads to put feet to our faith, to walk in obedience, to walk not only in freedom but setting others free, giving as we have received. Find us faithful to multiply the talents, the time, the treasures, the tongue, everything that you've given us to multiply for the kingdom of God, to live for what is eternal. By the power of your name, we ask you, by the power of your name, in the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 You can sit for just a minute, and um, I just want <clears throat> to say this, and then if there's any questions and answers, I want to give you time for that. But... Um, there's no way you can spend time with the king without getting an impartation from him. And so intercession might be the highest calling and the highest responsibility, but it's the greatest benefit in the kingdom. And it's not in just intercessors call to intercession. I'm going to say this, the moves of God that I've seen 
in churches <coughs> happening around America are happening because the pastors are on their knees praying with the people. They're not telling the people, you go pray. There's the prayer closet over there. There's the intercessors. No, they're praying with the people. They're at every prayer meeting, and it's the most important meeting there is. And so <coughs> encourage your pastors and your church leaders that this is not designated for a few. Soul winning is not for a few. It's the lifestyle of the believer. Prayer is not an event. It is a lifestyle, and it becomes a movement. Now, when we look at the Laodicean church in Revelations 3.18, it's a very dangerous place to be. But he said because we become lukewarm, he would spit us out of his mouth. Now, instead of getting upset or angry at the Laodicean church, which maybe God is and will bring judgment, but mercy triumphs over judgment. And right now we are at the mercy of God. Every day we live, we deserve judgment. And so we are asking God, revive your work in the midst of the years. So as we pray for mercy, for a rebellious, stiff-necked, stubborn bride, as we are, as he called Israel in a nation and generation, and we pray for mercy and stand in the gap on behalf, I pray very much Revelations 3.18. So he says, the condition of Laodicea, which is very much like America, is you think you're okay, America. You think you have need of nothing. You think you're wealthy and rich and just doing fine. But the truth is, you don't really know your condition. The truth is, you are really naked and blind and miserable and stiff-necked and so on and so forth, as he said about Israel, and lost your way. Now, isn't it wonderful and gracious and merciful of the Lord that he doesn't stop there? He says, I'm going to give you a remedy. I'm going to give you a remedy for being naked, blind, miserable, wretched, half-hearted, whatever. Lest you be spit out of my mouth. He said, but it's going to cost you something. And in this nation, we like to get things that don't cost too much or they don't take too long. They need to be microwave. And we want to see it just like that or we quit. And so he said, but you're going to have to buy something from me. And these are very serious instructions. And it's the only remedy for Laodicea. I will not offer to God that which costs me nothing, David said in 2 Samuel 24, 24. So we must buy something as a church. He said you're going to have to buy gold refined in the fire. You're going to have to pay a price for the gold. And Peter says the gold is the trial of your faith. It's more precious than gold. The trial of your faith. And many of us have been under the testing of our faith. How long will we hold on? How long do we keep believing when we see nothing? Whose report will you believe? The media or the fathers? Gold tried in the fire. And then Corinthians talks about our works not being wood, hay, and stubble but coming through the fire as gold. And those works mean they're not dead works, as James says, but they're living. Difference is a living work is birthed of the Spirit, born of the Spirit, and done by the Spirit. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. And it's dead works. We have a lot of good things that are dead works. But he wants gold. And that's when our works are ready to go through the fire because they were born of the Spirit and done by the Spirit. And then he said, I want you to buy salve for your eyes. Why? Well, we must be blind. We mu must have lost our way. And what about even if we're not blind spiritually and we know where we're going, do we see him every day? Jesus did. 
because he said my instructions are what I, are what I see him do. Our vision ought to be so keen and so clear. And the only way that it can be is when we guard our vision. If it's obscured with other things, David said, I'll put no unclean thing before me. Well, to me, most of the news is pretty unclean. And, I, and he said, I guard my eyes. I walk with integrity of my house. In Isaiah 33, it says, don't look, with blood don't look at bloodshed. If God, Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart. Out of it flow the issues of life. And your eyes and your ears are the gateways to your heart. And so he said, you need to be able to see again so you can see the king. And Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding are open. You can see the hope of, the, of your calling. So we need salve. We need the anointing of the spirit upon our eyes like Jesus spit and healed the blind man. And then Bartimaeus, I can see again. And you know why also that's important? Isaiah 6 says in, in his discussion with the Lord, God says that the ears of this people are dull and their eyes are blind. Their heart can't understand, so they can't be healed. So I said, you mean, Lord, if people could see you and hear and understand, they can be healed, even the loss? Yes. Yes. So we need salve. And then he said, and buy from me white linen. And white linen, again, is twofold. White linen talks in Revelations. There are those that follow the lamb whithersoever he goes. They're dressed in white. And that is the righteous deeds of the saints. That's what it says. The righteous deeds. The going out and putting feet to our faith. And it, be, it, it also depicts being dressed in robes of righteousness. The purity of the bride. Now this is one other thing about linen. In Ezekiel 44, when it's talking about the Zadok priesthood, the Lord said, Israel has sinned, so the priests can still minister to the people, but they can't come into the Holy of Holies and minister to me, only the Zadok priesthood, because they've kept themselves pure. I cry out all the time, Lord, I want to be of the Zadok priesthood. And then it says this in Ezekiel 44, it's very interesting. When they come into the Holy of Holies to minister to me, they can't wear wool because they'll sweat. They have to put on linen because you don't sweat you know what sweat is the efforts in the flesh of man and in his presence there's no sweat there's no human flesh to make it anything happen we put on linen so there's three perspectives of linen i've just told you that we buy from him and so revelations 318 gives in God's mercy, a wonderful remedy for the condition we find our nation in. And we can begin praying those things in, but we can't pray them in unless God works it in us. We're not praying for the others. Paul said, I will not talk about anything that God hasn't first worked in me. I was fighting with the sword of the spirit one time in battle, just binding, loosing. I'm using the sword out of my mouth like revelation. And he said, will you just stop a minute? And he said, take a look at your sword. Does it have blood on it? I just kind of, you know, in the spirit looking, I'm going, well, maybe I've, you know, decapitated a few demons. And he said, no, that's not what I mean. He said, does it have your blood on it? I said, my blood? And he said, yes, that is my weapon of heart surgery. That is my instrument for which I circumcise your heart as a skilled surgeon. And if your sword doesn't have the blood of your own heart being circumcised of the flesh, then you have little authority. But the swords that have the blood on it, where I have been able to circumcise the hearts, wage a war and yield a sword with great authority because it has been worked in us. And everything we pray, 
we pray, God, do it in me. And then that becomes, we're backing it with our testimony. Are there any questions about anything shared? I know probably people are weary, but yes.